um, ask a couple of other questions because we think about how businesses transitioning today from perhaps less of the face-to-face -face and more of the e-business. Mm -hmm. And how, mm -hmm. how are knowledge management and e-business connected or related? Well, in two ways. One is the speed factor. Um, if there was ever a business area that was growing fast where speed is important, it's e-business. Nobody can tell you they know the answer about e-business because we're all doing it now and hopefully learning. So the ability to learn quickly from every change or new um, exchange you create or convenience portal or anything you do, supply chain thing in e-business, your ability to learn quickly from that will put you in a position to be able to exploit it, learn from it, and do something different again. The speed factor also means that it's now much more about um, doing things good enough and not perfect. Speed, not perfection is the mantra in e-business. Why? Because they're hopefully do, taking an iterative approach. It's called the versioning approach. So an e-business company that's being asked to deliver something, a portal, for an organization that wants to link their suppliers and buyers together, has to put in place something that is no longer going to be given a year to design and develop. They've got to do something in three months, which means you don't do it perfect, you do it good enough, you learn from that and you do it better, and you keep doing this in an iterative approach, and that's how you stay ahead of the game or at least start to create a competitive playing field that puts you in a position of having the ball instead of being the reactive group. So speed and learning is critical and is something that knowledge management can be an enabler for. In fact, I say that knowledge management is a prerequisite for e-business these days. The other part that I think is very important and where KM and e-business really come together, where they're quite complementary, is in the whole idea of what it takes to transfer knowledge and the relationship aspect. You know, for me to transfer some know-how to you and for you to use it means we have to have, you have to know something about me. You have to understand how I learned what, way, what I learned. You have to trust me a little bit so that you take that knowledge and actually use it. E-business is the same thing. Anyone who thinks that the old adage, it's strictly business, is true in, in e-business um, has not done any sustainable e-business. To do e-business right, e-business is strictly personal. When it comes down to doing complex negotiations. I'm not talking about buying paper clips through an auction on the web. You don't care about who that comes from or what, you just want the cheapest price. But when it comes to creating partnerships and alliances quickly and building relationships fast electronically, that takes the same know-how and experience that it does to transfer knowledge from one person to another. Relationships and trust and our ability to build those relationships and trust electronically through partners and our supply chain and value chain is critical. So in that way, they both face the same challenges as well. Well, if you look at the challenges, and again, you're back on the dais giving your speech to this global global audience. What are some of the ideas, the, the new concepts, ideas surrounding knowledge management that, that you'd speak about and bring up to your, your audience? Well, there are some areas that I think we will see some big changes in. As much as I'm not a proponent of artificial intelligence right now for knowledge management, the truth is many times we need rule-based rule systems that can answer questions or um, provide knowledge very quickly. I'll give you for, uh, for instance. If you're running a big call center for an investment firm, mm -hmm and you get a million and a half calls a day, you don't want to use the approach that I have to then, for every million call, you know, go out and seek who knows what. You want to be able to say, what's that question? Hit a button and have the 10 most frequent answers pop up in your face. Right. Artificial intelligence, rules-based systems give you those constrained set of questions based on a set of logical series of questions that a knowledge engineer would help extract when they interviewed someone. And I think there's a time and a place for that. I think we're going to start to see those AI rule-based systems merge with the approach that I've been talking to you about that allow you to not constrain as much 
your thinking, but allow you to quickly get to the right people using some smart systems to help you do that. You've got a plot of land that represents mm -hmm. knowledge and knowledge management. You're going to fertilize it and things are going to come up. What's coming up? What's the future hold? What the future holds for me is much more moving from reuse of knowledge to creating new knowledge. And in fact, in many ways, the learning processes that we deploy actually get people to think for a change. And to me, this reflection, people taking the time to think, is profound. <laughs> but, and I know it sounds silly, but I think what we're going to find is that when people start thinking more on the job, they're going to be even more creative. and They're going to discover things that they might not have known or thought about before, and that will create some really new opportunities in the business world and in their personal life. How does an organization build in that time? What would your recommendations be when they say, we've got no time for things um, we've got to do? The only way I know, and this isn't, I'm sure it's not the only way, but it's the only way that I've been successful in cre helping people cre make time, to save time, is by finding some early adopters and making them successful in using the approaches we've talked about and showing them having a real tangible result that shows how you could save time by making time. And I think, Ken, you've shared some incredible things today with us, and we appreciate it. And that lens, that looking to the future, the utilization of knowledge is going to be incredibly important for all of us to be successful. Thank you very much for your insights. We appreciate You're them. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, let us begin with the first question and answer session. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible. Therefore, we ask that only one question be asked per phone call and that these questions be as brief as possible. You may call the studio directly at the phone numbers or fax, which appear on your screen. And we remind you to make your phone calls at a distance from the monitor to help in avoiding feedback. And our first call today comes from the Federation Nacional de Comerciantes from Medellin, Colombia. And the question, please. Buenos dias. Our question is the following. How can you articulate the rhythm technique to a, uh, an organization that has hierarchies? Thank you. And thank you. We're, we're sort of bridging into the next segment a little bit, but let me shoot over to Paul and talk quickly about the rhythm technique with a hierarchical organization. Well, um, as it relates to the process that I deliver, uh, really what it is about is the integration of all the different levels. And even if there's a hierarchical, a very strict sort of hierarchy about how an organization is organized, I think the benefit comes from people being able to see the unique contributions that each of the levels uh, contribute to the others. And, it, and in, even more particularly, not just hierarchies, but uh, for instance, manufacturing. What manufacturing can contribute to sales? What sales can contribute to customer service? You know, the, the bridges among uh, some of those different, in a sense, silos, so that all parts can know how to work together. Okay, good. Thanks. Kent, any, any comments along that same, the application of a methodology into a hierarchical organization? Well, I'm thinking of the, um, when I think of rhythm and I think of music, I, I often talk a lot about knowledge management as being more like being, playing in a jazz combo. Paul and I were just talking about that, which means that leveraging knowledge from people is about taking the pieces of know-how that you can get and putting them together differently to meet your own unique needs and in an organization that's very hierarchical you'll still find that people have needs that cut across the organization and people's ability to work together to leverage their different strengths from different departments different functions within the business provides a richness of knowledge that i think transcends organizational boundaries very good, and, and there's going to be a knowledge component in that somewhere. I know there will be. And our next question comes to us from the uh, Tecnológico Institute in León. And if we may have our question, please. León, Mexico. My question is the following. How can cultural differences impact the <coughs> knowledge management? Thank you very much for your answer. 
cultural issues, cultural differences, and knowledge management? Great question. It is a very good question because it's part of the reality that we deal with. Um, as I said earlier, knowledge is really about people. People have knowledge. Groups of people can have knowledge. And our ability to understand and meet people where they're at in terms of their cultural differences plays a very key role. What I have found is when it comes down to sharing know-how, one of the things that cuts across all the cultural boundaries is focusing on building relationships and trust. And if you can get to that point, it doesn't matter what culture you're from. I think where cultural differences make the most impact is what does it take within your culture to build relationships and trust? And in many countries, especially in my work in Latin America, what I've noticed is that people like to build relationships, like to get to know people. And in fact, I think it becomes a tremendous enabler in Latin America for people who want to share know-how that they understand what it takes to build relationships so that they share something that's actually meaningful and truthful. So I think it's very important because you can't go in and ask an organization or a group of people to be something that they're not. You have to meet people where they're at. And understanding their cultural differences can actually help facilitate knowledge transfer. And if you're not aware of them, then they can become a barrier in itself. Very good. Thanks. Those are great, great points. And our next question comes to us from the uh, University in Sonora, Hermosillo, Sonora, Mexico. Greetings from the University of Sonora in Mexico. Uh, our question is the following. What techniques and skills or strategies can you develop or what would be the elements to be developed by a leader in order to promote this creating of this new knowledge within the organization, but also in order to function within this global context and sharing this uh, knowledge and skills that each one has within the group and within the organization? How can the leader develop these skills so that the, he can promote it within the organization? Very good. And I, and I think Kent has some experiences with this, the promotion of knowledge management, skill development, the elements of, of knowledge management. Go ahead, Kent. The, uh, the requirement of leadership is probably the most important element that I find for knowledge management success. What I find is important is to have a capability to create the demand for people to share and often that comes from a leader creating a crisis or raising the bar continuously when performance is delivered to a desired level. To me there's no replacement of having a leader who can set expectations that cause people to reach out of their comfort zone and actually ask for help ask people what they know so that they can take that and adapt it and use, their, use it in their own situation. Of course there are skills around technologies and being able to use some of the newer technologies that allow a very rich communication and interaction to occur between people. So the more frequent you can interact with people using today's technology such as chat rooms but more importantly things like this medium, television and video conferencing, the more relationships you'll be able to build and as a leader creating that competency for using the technologies that create a rich communication that allows people to virtually work together or team together is critical and I would also add uh, the ability to incentivize or to reward people for good instances of sharing and making what they know available to others is fundamental to success follow Paul anything that yeah I just would like to add to that that if people have the opportunity to really experience some type of a win situation sort of like what uh, Kent suggested when a leader for instance uh, creates some type of crisis if they can uh, come up against um, seemingly insurmountable odds and then have a win type of experience where they have really accomplished those goals then that will give them the incentive, the motivation to share more of that information because they understand why they would want to do that and why it's in everybody's best interest to do that. In your, in your segment, you'll talk about how to bridge the performance aspect of wrapping those together and, and making it work from a synergistic perspective. Yes. Very good. We're going to take a question now from the uh, Universidad Autonoma in Los Cabos, Baja, California Sur.
Buenos días. We're calling from Cabo San Lucas, and our question is the following. How would you project a future in order to um, apply this to Mexico? How would you propose this kind of knowledge to be applied in, in a country in a countrywide level? Knowledge management, an international marketplace forum. You've had some experiences there, Kent, so I'll come to you with this question. I would think the the challenges that you faced that you face in Mexico are not unlike challenges that you face in other countries that are trying to learn very quickly and grow economically as well as socially where you're faced with uh, the need to or the opportunity to learn from others who've done it before. So I think in many cases we find that the ability for people to learn from others is often facilitated in countries where people know that it's okay to learn from other people and that they shouldn't already have the answer. So in many ways being in a position where you see some possibilities and you know there are maybe other developed countries that have done some things before, it provides a great medium and need an opportunity to get some knowledge from some other people they may happen to be in different cultures in different countries and actually learn from that and adapt it to your own situation and your own problems and your own opportunities so I feel the opportunities there the timing is right one of the things that the country would need would be some infrastructure to make it easy to share and easy to communicate with other countries and we have some great examples of that the internet is ubiquitous and while knowledge is different from information and data, we don't have to use that as a barrier or a way to keep us from sharing what we know, but use things like the Internet and make them accessible to people so that you could create communication with others and make it very easier so it's one less reason you have not to share with others. Very good. good. Some good detail and some good practice in that question. We're going to take a question now from the uh, Universidad Autonoma in La Paz. A reality in our country, Mexico, is that not all the team members think the same way and work at the same pace. And therefore, you cannot separate that person from the team, of course, for several reasons. What do you suggest that you can do to motivate these people or the group itself and make the breakthroughs that we're looking for. Let me let me shift the tables here and come to Paul with this because we have a sure. team question. How do you make the team work? Well, I think what's interesting about those different kinds of styles and different kinds of intelligences is that they all have something to contribute to each other. And so, for instance, if you have some type of uh, a challenge where instead of just having individuals answer a certain question and then you find out what all the individuals' answers are, if you get a whole group of people who really actually purposely have different perspectives to share, usually what happens is that one side, a knowledge side, for instance, will inform maybe a performance side what, you know, what uh, the, the analytical construct of something is to actually get the performance done and vice versa. Uh, there are many different um, aspects to actually materializing performance as opposed to just knowing something. So it really comes down to uh, the sharing of that information and the, re the validation of all the different contributions that people have to make to each other. And then, so it's actually two parts. There's the validation of each type of perspective and then it's the challenging people to take responsibility for their contribution and to really step up to the plate and to really fully uh, engage the others and yourself in that total process. Very good. Thank you, Paul. Any quick follow-up on that, Kent? I would add that um, it's, a, it's a common occurrence that we find when we try and pull people together, whether it's a team or what we call a community of practice people who do similar things whether they're in the same company in the same team or even in the same country and what we often try and do is is get people to understand the differences that they have so that they know why maybe someone feels a certain way or they're not interacting and then use that to 
inquire as to what know-how they bring to the table even though it's coming from a very different perspective because we find it's that richness and diversity of knowledge and the way people have experienced things in the past that actually creates something better than what we could have done if we all knew the same thing and I would say that um, personally my own views have been changed drastically by what other people who do things and know things differently than me have brought into the conversation that I've been part of and it almost in every case we find a better solution and it's a way of pulling people together for a common purpose to find what turns them on together very good thank you let's let's move now to the uh, Universidad Tecnológica in Panama and a question from Panama please good morning we want to know in our cultures, for example, we have a certain reality in many organizations and companies. We have the ex-technology where the boss is the boss and he thinks that the employee is just uh, is lazy and doesn't do is good for nothing, basically, right? In these kinds of big companies, how do you share the knowledge of each one of the employees, knowing that not all employees have the same opportunity to express themselves and their ideas and the creativity? In other words, we have geniuses in the companies, and they haven't been recognized or acknowledged or discovered. Great, great question. Uh, Kent, can you kind of approach the, the recognition of, of knowledge? And Yes, I can. The, the key is always trying to find something that more than one person wants to tackle or to try and achieve. And you may find that th there is a common need amongst people that doesn't involve the boss or the manager, but that does excite people in the organization to accomplish something that's great. And it may be something that they know more about than let's say their superiors and if they could put a business uh, need around that and be able to show how together they could impact some performance that often makes superiors stand up and take notice and by working together they produce a better outcome than they could have individually and often then that gives them the license to do more of this Great, and I think we're going to find some, some team references here. That's, that's a great, great, great question, great response. Thank you. We're going to take a question now from our friends in Cuba from Sinia Internet. And the question, please. Would you please elaborate a little bit more on the risk of not engaging the knowledge in any organization? Thank you. I'll just go right to you, Kent, on this one. Sure. The risk that people face by not leveraging their know-how and experience or the experience of others is decline. Decline in their business, decline in their performance, and often a decline in their own personal development. The world doesn't stand still. And anyone who thinks that they have the only answer to something will find by talking to other people and interacting with society in general that somewhere somehow someone has done it before and our ability to constantly renew what we know and use that to create something new is critical to our success and to continuous growth let's put it this way if you create a service or or a product through your company and you're out there marketing it and using it to generate revenue to make money somewhere someone else is going to do the same thing they're either doing it already or they will our ability to copy and then use that to take ideas from other people if anything has been accelerated by the technology and the communication media that's out there so that if you've got an idea and you put it in practice someone else will be copying it very soon so if you don't strive to continuously improve that by learning from others and putting it together differently and adapting it to create new products and new services you will quickly fall behind if we don't learn from the past if we don't engage the past we're doomed to repeat some of the elements of the past and, sure. and we want to grow organically from that let's take a question now from the central university in Tijuana Tijuana Mexico
Yes, buenos días. We would like to know how you can start, get started in the knowledge of, in the administration of knowledge, management of knowledge. Two or three key elements, Kent, in getting started? Sure. The very first thing I would recommend is look around for where some people have already been doing knowledge management, even though you may not have called it that. The fact is, in most organizations, somebody has done some good work either reusing a good practice and adopting it to improve upon it, or they've done some learning in a way that's impacted performance. The words knowledge management often get in the way. And if we could look around and find some good things that people have done where they've shared know-how and improved performance, that's a great place to start because it shows that it's okay to do that in your organization. The second thing I would do would be to identify some area of your business where performance improvement is needed, where it's not a nice to have, but something that's important enough that people will stand up and rally behind it and help share their know-how because it will make a difference to what you're about as a company. And finally, the third thing is to not be afraid to ask for help, to admit that maybe you don't know everything, and seek simply by asking others, hey, have you ever done this before? Here's what I'm going to do. Do you know anyone who's done this? And in that way, it starts the knowledge sharing process with some, hopefully, performance improvements and relying and noticing that it's okay to do it in your organization. Is that how you've done it at SAIC? It's how I've done it in every organization in about 15 companies since I've left BP, and it's how we did it in BP. It's really important to show people that they actually have some of the answers themselves, and it's okay to try, and there's nothing like delivering some quick win in terms of performance, and Paul alluded to this in one of his earlier questions. Being able to focus on something you can touch and feel creates an upswell in people because they now know that it's possible to do it and make a difference. Okay. Actually, I don't have anything more to add on to that ex uh, other than um, actually what he just said is what I would have said. What he said. Okay. That works really well. Yeah. There we go. Thank you for your questions, great questions, and for your responses, gentlemen. Let's now move to the second module of our program in which Paul Chico will tell us about his productivity improving team rhythm process. Thank you. Let me begin by asking a simple question. What moves you or your colleagues to take action? Is having a strong gut feeling enough? Would your yearning to feel connected to your associates move you to act? Is it sufficient to understand intellectually what you should do? How about a grand vision? Would that inspire you to take action? I believe that the correct answer is all of the above. Every individual needs a body, a heart, a mind, and a spirit. Likewise, every organization needs will, trust, intelligence and clear vision. This is true whether we're talking about corporations, government agencies or universities and schools. The balance of these essential elements is what creates alignment and synergy. Team rhythm is an experience that allows people to explore these dimensions of synergy. In this age of the internet the power of information is shared not withheld. Old hierarchies are flattening. What was once a linear organizational chart has now become a matrix of interdependent relationships. High-tech computer and telephone networks may connect us to the rest of the world. They do not help us know what to say to each other. According to John Nesbitt in his book Megatrends, Every development in high technology requires a high-touch balance. There is still no substitute for actual human contact. Now more than ever, we need to cultivate community. My own Team Rhythm Workshop is one example of a new approach to organizational learning. There are many more. This particular training technology is not something that can be networked over the web. 
It's all about people being in a room together in real time. Team Rhythm allows participants to see, hear, and feel the value of team synergy. People can literally shake loose from their conceptual and interpersonal barriers to achieve high performance. This is a rich metaphorical experience that touches people personally and professionally. What are some of the benefits of Team Rhythm? Well, it helps teams reach alignment towards high performance. It demonstrates effective creative collaboration. It balances personal power and collective responsibility. And it models authentic feedback and active listening skills. It's not enough anymore to just supply people with theoretical information. We must also provide meaningful experiences so that learners can master useful behavioral skills. In their book, The Experience Economy, Work is Theater and Every Business a Stage, Joseph Pine II and James H. Gilmore explore a new blueprint for success. They examine how organizations can use goods as props and services as the stage. The result can create experiences that engage customers in, it, in an inherently personal way. The active focus shifts from the teacher as learning manager to the student's personal quest. This type of educational experience leaves indelible impressions. Indelible impressions ignite sparks of curiosity within learners. People are motivated to action because they can integrate intellectual knowledge with emotional energy. This is the basis for performance-based competency. Team rhythm is this kind of experience that leaves indelible impressions. I use the power of metaphor to show people the different side of themselves. I will spend the bulk of my time today telling my story of team rhythm. Later, I will also present information about two of my colleague organizations, the Grove Consultants International and Barnes & Conti Associates. Through its strategic visioning process, the Grove uses words and pictures to clarify a team's vision and action steps. Barnes & Conti Associates promotes clear interpersonal communication through its program, Exercising Influence. The more multicultural our organizations become, the more we need to return to human essentials. The theory that Team Rhythm is based on is as essential as earth, fire, air, and water. Team Rhythm also utilizes the oldest known international language, rhythm. Though many people confess they don't have rhythm, everyone breathes, everyone heart, everyone's heart beats. Rhythm is everywhere, whether or not we are aware of it. Through rhythm, people from various cultures 